Hello, and welcome to the Pragmatic Live podcast series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management, product marketing, and other market and data-driven professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I'm Rebecca Calajaris, Vice President of Marketing and Product Strategy at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. I'm excited today to have Jane Morgan on our podcast, B2B marketing consultant to the technology industry and founder of Gendelity, an organization dedicated to forward to working towards gender inclusive workplaces, providing practical actions to move organizations forward. Welcome, Jane. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm delighted to be here. All right, Jane, let's start. Let's give our listeners a little bit about your background and, and kind of what got you so focused on this great topic. Yeah, so my background is in product management. Um, I've worked in the tech industry for almost 20 years now. Um, The guts of that in product development, B2B product development, and I've done software and hardware and uh, mostly international. I used to live in Rhode Island and in the States and uh, spent some of my career in Germany as well. Uh, But as you can hear, I'm not American um, and I'm back in Ireland now for the last few years. So I have two different hats at the moment. One is, as you said, um, as a marketing consultant to the B2B tech industry, and that is often helping people about with their product management, uh, you know, understanding customer needs, how big is the market, segmentation, all, all the good stuff that you'll find in the pragmatic marketing framework. Uh, but I also have Gendality, and Gendality came about um, for a few reasons. So one was that I banged my own head off the glass ceiling a few times, and um, and somebody said to me, you know, that hurts. <laughs> you get a bruise. Um, but the thing that tipped me over the edge really was um, a younger family member who had just finished a master's in science and got career advice related to salary that was just so awful that I really thought, OK, there's a lot known about, you know, what not to do around the area of salary negotiation and the gender pay gap and things like that. You know, I think we can do a better job in communicating actions for individuals because, you know, we don't live in an ideal world, but each of us individually in the workplace, whether that's a product management workplace or another workplace, there are some things that we can do. Um, But of course, the big one is actions for organizations. I mean, ultimately, people are responsible for the organizations that they lead. Um, and we do, I think, need to um, lean on those organizations, um, you know, to change the structure within which um, people work so that we have more gender inclusive and, and otherwise inclusive, you know, organizations. So that's sort of where I'm at. Awesome. So I, I think that's really interesting having, uh, we were talking a little bit uh, before we did the podcast about the annual survey that we do, right? So we usually get yeah. 2,000, 3,000 uh, members of the product teams from all over the world talking about, you know, who they are, what they earn, what they work on. And I always notice two things. One is the gap in the number of women in product in general, right? Uh, you know, in the in the U.S. at this point, it's about 58, 42. When I look at Europe, it's, it's still more 70, 30, just getting women in the door. Uh, and then there's the questions about, great, I'm in the door, what am, how am I earning compared to my uh, peers? And one of the, the the great things about owning a data set like we have is that we can really standardize that data. We can we can normalize it or or make it consistent for type of experience, degree, size of company, and really still see that that gap exists. Yeah. Uh, I, sorry. Go ahead. No, and and I mean I think uh, uh, it is not something that we have way too much evidence that it exists and it exists at all levels and we can pull out that data. And it is to your point, both the responsibilities of individuals and of the organizations uh, to really work on that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I I personally found it instructive to um, look back and see, well, how did we get it? Like, why do we not have, you know, gender equality in the workplace? It's like, you know, <laughs> this is like 2021, you know, uh, and you know, I, I graduate, I'll age myself now here and say, I, you know, I graduated in 1992 and it never occurred to me, you know, coming out of, um, you know, co-education, you know, very liberal. I did studied marketing, most most unusual in the product management background. Like I actually studied marketing, what a concept. Um, 
but it never occurred to me that we would, you know, still in this day and age have have this problem. Uh, you know, that, that women don't have an equal voice at the table, that they're not earning on the same uh, rate, you know, that it's harder for them to get promoted. I mean, it's, you know, it's really annoying stuff. But I, I personally found it instructive to look back and see, you know, where have we come from? And I, I think we're we're still learning about things. I and mean, when we know, for example, that one of the major influences on people's um, current salary is what their previous salary was. So if you so if as a young woman in your career you start out at a disadvantage, and uh, Linda Babcock did some research on that, that um, it's not obvious to early career women that you can negotiate your starting salary, which you absolutely can. And if if you don't negotiate your starting salary and you start out, you know, a thousand dollars or three thousand dollars more, and then you have the same career directory with no percentage difference from your male peer, by the end of of your careers when you retire, you know, the man has earned approximately a million dollars more than the woman just from starting out on on an eleven basis. So mid-career you know an employer asking you or a potential employer asking you you know what are you currently on uh, you know a lot of the states have outlawed that now and I'm absolutely in favor of that practice and you should you know when somebody asks you that you should hedge and you uh, and you should do your market research and say well what you know what is the, the going rate for this job in this market and the pragmatic survey gives you, you know, a good anchor for that. And there's also a good steer around things. You know, there's seniority, but there's also geography. You know, so it, it's very important, I think, to lean into knowledge resources like yours to see to see that that's the case. But um, I mean, a, a big your bigger question there is, you know, how do we get more women in? And I, I, personally, I think STEM is important uh, because it's the future. I mean, we are making products for the future. And I do think there's a little bit of um, sort of a negative, you know, that it's very, you know, it's maybe very engineering focused and you have to, you know, involve, love tinkering with bits and bobs or bits and bytes, you know, the software space. You know, really what product management is about is making stuff better. You know, I mean, the coronavirus is a, an interesting example. You know, we want to, you, know, um, you know, make cures and better ventilators and, you know, use 3D printing. And I mean, those are all uh, very human things that are in the product development space, but people can relate to I'm making the world a better place here. You know, so so I do think there is sort of um, a marketing of the career, if you will, Um that needs to lean into more of making, you know, making the world a better place. Um, so I think that's one of the messages that we can to get over, you know, the 60-40 or the 70-30 bias, you know, in favor of, of one gender there. Absolutely. I mean, it's problem solving, right? It's recognizing problems and problem solving. And that is something uh, that, that, I actually think women do remarkably well, but I'm not going to say better or worse than men. I don't know that that, you know, I don't think that's there, yeah. but it is definitely something uh, that that is in a wheelhouse of things we do regularly, right? Um, all right, so we talked a little bit about the, the pay gap and sort of the actions for the individuals and the actions for the organization. And I would love to kind of step through those. So let's, let me, let's start with the individuals. As an individual woman uh, in, in the workforce, how can I help uh, fight this gap? Uh, so, well, if you're a team leader, let's kind of pick the easier one. Um, you know, so if you're a team leader, um, w- the very first action that you should do is um, get your team benchmarked against the marketplace. You know, are my team being f- paired, paid fairly relative to the going rate in the marketplace? And, uh, you know, HR professionals have a lot of, you know, generally they have a lot of experience in this place, in this kind of space. You know, what what are the core activities that product managers need to do and how well are people on my team able to do that? You know, so you have a list of tasks on uh, in the pragmatic framework or I mean, one of the things that I particularly liked in um, not this year's survey or the previous year's survey, and you had divided it out between um it was two sides of the graph. You know, we had uh, business activities and technical activities and there's how much you, you were doing it and how much you wanted to be doing it, I think I think it was. And um, you want to make sure that as a manager that you're um, encouraging skill development in all of those areas. Of, you know, of course, some people are going to be good 
at some things rather than others. But you don't you don't want to find yourself in a in a situation where you keep giving you know the really exciting project where people are learning, getting visibility to the to the rest of the organization. You know they're developing their skills. You know, and it might be things like presenting skills or you know doing a win loss analysis or whatever it happens to be. But also their knowledge of the of the marketplace. So there are kind of three core things from a career perspective: your your social capital, you know who who you know. And I think let's come back to that just in a second, because I think sometimes women are a little bit allergic to networking, you know, it's a term. But, you know, the second one is your is your skills, uh, you know, what, what you're able to do. And then the third one is your knowledge. And that might be formal education or ongoing certification. Um, but it's also, pra- you know, practice for learning those things. So as a manager, are you looking at all of those three areas and growing the skills of everybody on your team equally, you know, that you're not... Um, giving some nice assignments to one person over the other you know so that's two things consider your salary and consider the skill development um, across your teams and then from a from a managing up perspective um, you know there's legislation now in the UK already it's it's coming in Ireland we hope and it's in draft legislation around uh, gender pay transparency and uh, you know so you can go to the other people in your organization say do we have a gender pay gap you know, are, are people paid more than others? And of course, the big tech companies, you know, whether it's Google and Facebook or all those big, you know, they don't name drop all of them, but those big tech companies are already publishing their salaries. So I think there's an opportunity to take advantage of that momentum and say, you know, are we are, are we are we part of this? Uh, so now you end up that you have, as any good product manager knows, you've got your quality, your quantitative data, you know, the facts, the facts to work off it. Um, and I, I think it's I think it's important to say as well that it's not only about gender. I mean, it's all you know. Obviously, you know, women are half of the population. Men are half of the population. You know, we should have representation broadly there. But there are also other sectors of the population that you know get less of a look in today than they should. And we want to make sure that you know that that we're we're also you know consider considering things like you know racism and you know racial inclusion and things like that so I think the momentum is with the gender pay gap at the moment but and uh, we shouldn't let that blind us to the other as- aspects of it you know so as a manager those are things that are not going to rock the boat you know there are questions there are learning in the organization you know and leaning into the to the data that, that we already have so are you, are you a line manager yourself I am. I am. Yes. Uh, and, and I was, I was thinking this too, like the, I think one of the reasons, uh, or excuses, I'm not sure which one it is that women don't sometimes do this, right. Is the fear that stepping forward is going to label them. Right. Like, geez, if I'm the one who brings it up, does that look like I'm a troublemaker or I, uh, have a complaint about myself. Right. And I mean, I, this is, uh, this is just truth about social change in general, it but, is, yeah. right. I mean, it's the fear of stepping forward for what's right leaves you vulnerable because you're, you're forward. The rest of the group's a little bit behind you and you look around and you think, Oh dang, this is scary. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think there's a couple of things there. Uh, how, 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 how do we address that? Do we just go, yes, it's true. It's scary. Go forward. And be brave. <laughs> yeah, I definitely. I mean, there's definitely a large element of that. You know, the phrase in my head is, "It's always the right thing. To, it's always the right time to do the right thing." Yep. You don't have to. You know, we run a course for salary negotiation for professional women, and one of the things that that's that's key is, you know, negotiation is not an argument. Negotiation is a process of, you know, considering my perspective and considering your perspective, and both of us learning and opening. It's like the Stephen Covey thing of win-win and all those good things that we know about negotiating, you know, seek first to understand and then to be understood. So it's a coming together and a sharing of ideas, but somebody needs to put the idea on the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I think you, I think you can, um, you can argue that if, um, you know, if, if, if senior women are not willing to put the idea on the table, then, you know, what party are we at here? (laughs) You know, you know, yes, it might, you know, be self-serving, um, but I think th- those actions for, for managers that we spoke about there, they're gender neutral. Anyone could do those. You don't have to mm-hmm. be a woman to do them. And, I, you know, and we said we come back to the situation of social capital. And I, this is probably a good segue to do that. You know, 
work is about relationships and it's about, you know, building um, good ways of working together. And negotiation is part of that. And, you know, negotiating on behalf of your team and behalf of yourself is part of that. I mean, I think that I think the difference or, or you know, the st- one of the one of the differences that have been found in psychology be- between women and men is confidence. It's it's, you know, Linda Babcock did. Um, you're probably familiar with that book of uh, Women Don't Ask. So in the meantime, what they have discovered is, well, women ask and negotiate very effectively when it's on behalf of somebody else. But there is this double bind of, you know, I have to be seen nice and pleasant and all those things. And yet I need a certain amount of toughness to be considered competent. And we see that all over the place in politics and and business. So I think, yeah, I I think there is an element of just, you know, not approaching it as an argument, but leaning into my social capital, you know, whether it's the man in the blah, blah department, you know, who I'm friendly with. Um, you know, asking them to row in behind me, um, you know, and just just going for it, you know. I mean, I will say that th- there's also a lot of evidence that when a man brings it up, it's easier to get hurt, you know. So if something happens in a meeting, and we'll just say the woman is consistently talked over, if the senior man in the room says, you know, would you please let Jane be heard or, you know, Jane, what were you saying? You know, a small opener, like the choose to challenge that we, you know, International Women's Day this year, choose to challenge. Say, you know, I didn't, can we let Jane finish her point? When the man says it, it's much easier for the man to get hurt. So we do need our male colleagues, you know, that social capital piece to to lean in for us, you know. Yeah. And I even think it would feel less risky um, if there were multiple, right? So it, a man in there would be great. If we can't do that, that's okay, right? We can band together and maybe talk to your other women line managers about yeah. making this a different, uh, a, a different approach. It's it is a day. Well, you know, anytime you're fighting for change, uh, it can be very scary. It can feel very vulnerable. Um, very vulnerable. Very but vulnerable. if but if we don't do it, who will? Yeah. Right. I mean, I think we have to do it. And I mean, you know, one of the things that that people look to from a historical perspective is affirmative action. You know, all of the things that, uh, you know, helped uh, black people and people of color and Asian people and Native American people, basically everybody's not a male, white, heterosexual man, uh, you know, get a look in. You know, we we need to look to what, you know, has been learned in other spaces and, you know, bring those learnings um, to this place as well. And yeah, it can be uncomfortable, you know. All right, so we talked a little bit about online managers and what they should do. Uh, from an individual uh, contributor perspective, we talked about just the the necessity of negotiating along every step of your career because yeah. the gap early on just gets expanded out. Anything else in the inv- individual space? Yeah, so one of the other things in the individual space is that um, you know it, it's partly related to the confidence piece and it's partly related to the sort of gender socialization that, you know, with the... If I'm a good girl and I work hard, I'll be promoted, and that's not enough. Um, you know, we know that doesn't we know that doesn't work. It just it it literally doesn't work. Um, and and an easy way to kind of comprehend that is if if you have six people who report to you, and uh, we'll just we'll just stick with your ratio and we'll say you know two thirds of them are men and a third are women, and the two thirds come and say, oh, you know, I'd be interested in that nice project that's coming up, which would give me an opportunity to present, or, you know, I really am not comfortable about my blah, blah skills, I I want to do that. And they say, oh, you know, I'm hoping that the salary review, when it comes up, I feel like, you know, I'll be worthy. Then if the men are constantly, you know, seeding and asking about those areas, and the women are diligently working away and not asking, you know, what would you see as a manager? Hopefully you'll also see your your um, the people who are not asking, but you do want to make your uh, interests known to your line manager. You know, and it, it's not uh, you need you need to make your interests known to your line manager. And I mean, this is also true of shy men. I have a friend of mine who's always saying, "Well, what about the shy man?" <laughs> you know, everybody should you know everybody's manager should have a general idea of if such and such a project comes up, they're interested. But you've got to say it, people aren't good mind readers, you know. So that's, you know, that's another piece that the individuals do. I mean, quite a bit of evidence also to show that um, women tend, 
more often than men to change jobs because they haven't got the promotion. So, you know, be aware if people on your team, you know, you need to, as a line manager, know, are they happy? And that, you know, they might just pick up their bags and go somewhere else, um, you know, if to get that pay rise. You know, so that happens. So there's a really interesting survey done about Deloitte, and it's a it's a good few years now. And Deloitte thought all, all the the female managers that are going home to mind the kids. You know, mid career going home to mind the kids, and uh, so they kind of dug into it, full sure that that's what they were going to find. And actually, they discovered oh, they're going to the competitors because the competitors have more flexible work options. So imagine all the investment and training, knowledge building went somewhere else you know so so I do think the there is a responsibility on individuals as well just you know to make known what they're interested in um and go there but you know at the end of the day you're responsible for your career line manager is not responsible for your career and if you need to go somewhere else to get what you need in terms of next development for your career and and maybe that means salary then that's what you got to do you know yeah I would definitely say early in my career I was the um you know, you work hard and you get rewarded. And if you don't get rewarded, you move on, but you never tell anyone. I mean, not that I didn't tell people what I wanted, but I, I wasn't as clear. And so I would leave and they're like, no, don't go. And it's like, but you didn't. And, and part of me was like, you saw how hard I was working. How could you not recognize it? The other part is to your point, I, I could also make things more clear. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, there is the social, the socialization of the good girl, you know, be the good girl. And I think for me, it's a, People are not mind readers, you know, share politely and kindly, you know, negotiation is not an argument. You're just sharing what you're interested in, you know. So, so let's talk about organizations, right? So we have individuals uh, at all levels of the organization fighting for change here and really recognizing that there is, a, is something to change. But let's talk a little bit about organizations and what sort of real practical steps they can take uh, to help fight this problem. Yeah. So at a at a big picture level, um, you know, what's, what's your ideal scenario? So your ideal scenario is you have a CEO who's passionate about it and believes in it. Uh, and you do what every good change management uh, book and strategy on the planet says. You build a strategy, you make a plan, you resource the plan with people and money. You do your metrics, measure outcomes, and you loop back and build in the learnings as you go along. Right? And that that might be, you know, HR might be the lead uh, person in that space, or it might be, you know, within it within a department. But, but that's your ideal scenario. And, and, and it, to change the organization or to make the, the organization more gender inclusive or inclusive in general, you have to consider people across their career. So you have. You have early career all the way through later career, and then you have people coming into the organization, to, you know, talent development all the way through promotion and then on to the next step. And then you're into the next role and it's the same again, talent development on to the next step. I mean, that's ideally what you want. So that's kind of your macro framework of what you're looking for. But that's very idealistic, isn't it? <laughs> you know, so so what so what's a more likely scenario? Uh, you know, a more likely scenario is um, the re resource groups. I think they sometimes get a bad rap, um, but I'm a fan of resource groups, um, and that might be you know LGBTQI resource groups, or it might be Latinas resource groups, or it might be women in tech resource groups, or whatever whatever it happens to be. And I think the value Hold on. of those. When you say resource group, what do you mean? I mean a group great question. I mean a group of individuals um who come together around a, a shared concept. So it might be women in the workplace, um, you know, it might be Latinas in the workplace, it might be LGBTQI people in the workplace. Um it, it could also be, you know people who are interested in soccer in the workplace or the basketball team. I worked in an organization one time where, the, where our CMO was big into cycling. Well, it wasn't a great surprise that loads of people took up cycling. You know, why not? Like, you know, and of course, if you if it turned out that you were interested in cycling, then it was a great way to get to know other people in the organization. But I think the, the value of those resource groups is in um, the, in, the informal sharing. Um, 
So, of course, the, you know, the bad version of that is, you know, figuring out who the Harvey Weinsteins are and, you know, giving them a wide gap. Um, but, the, but, the, but the upside of that is that, you know, what you learn through informal networks. Oh, you know, there might be a job opportunity going over there or we're thinking of getting into such and such a market area. So, so say, say pragmatic, pragmatic and uh, data analytics. You know, if there's if there's a group across the organization that's saying, oh, we're thinking about getting into data analytics or whatever, well, that's an, another way to learn, which also to share, you know, find out what the commonalities are to, to your workplace experience um, that mightn't otherwise be available to you, particularly for women in product management, because there's so, so few of them, you know, so. I mean, one of the things that we discover on our salary negotiation course is we, we, we share uh, survey data um, that shows that people are actually willing to share their own ser- their own salary, but they don't think other people are, but actually they are willing to themselves. And so then we asked them, said, OK, well, are you willing to share yours anonymously? And the overwhelming majority of people say yes. You know, so that's very empowering if you're negotiating in the workplace, you know, so. But for, but from an organization standpoint, you know, finding people who are in similar, um, you know, demographic to you or so, have something in, in common and coming together and saying, let's let's have, have you know, have our coffee morning at 11 o'clock until 11.20, the first Tuesday of every month for women in the organization, for example, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think the point about transparency is really, is kind of key. Right. Uh, transparency helps people know where they stand and it kind of brings any issues or non-issues out front. Um, setting up the resource groups and sort of proactively saying it's OK to have a point of view as a member of this group. Right. It's a safety message to say to yeah. some degree, like if we have a, a women's thing every month, then it's OK to recognize that there is some differences in some areas to go. Um, one of the things that I uh really appreciated as a member of the exec team here at Pragmatic is as we went through COVID, our CEO, who is a gentleman, um, really would, you know, several times really intentionally open conversations saying it matters to me that women don't leave, don't get burnt out because they're juggling all these other pieces. What do I need to do? And he brought it up. And the change of like just him bringing it up made the whole thing so different uh, and, and such a, a, uh, a safer place to, to talk about it and, and be about it because he was very proactive. And I think that's true. Um, you know, that's, that's definitely true if, uh, as for women, but I also think it's true for other minorities, right? In the, in the States, we had a lot of unrest and protests last year. And again, when when you can open up that dialogue and give people conversations and say it matters to me that you yeah. feel heard and safe is one of the most powerful things. Um, it, it was extraordinarily meaningful to me here in my career. Um, and it made me recognize just what a strong behavior that can be, yeah. uh, that we should be practicing more proactively instead of waiting yeah. for them to go, I've got a concern or problem. Be like, hey, I was thinking about this. Is this hard? What can I do? Yep, absolutely. I think, you know, I think leaders need to lead. And, you know, I think as a leader, you can sometimes underestimate the impact that you're having, you know. So so that's so that's that's two very big cases. I mean, the other thing that organizations can do is they can look and see if they have a gender pay gap themselves in the organization, as we've, we'd already touched on. Um, and a big one um, is also around um, benefits. And benefits might ne- doesn't necessarily mean financial. Um, obviously, financial is a big part of it. You know, if if you know you have an organization and you have pension plans and maybe you have healthcare and bonuses and what you know all those things, um, they're they're important to look at. But um, the other side of it, you know, flexible work options. I mean, the remote, the working remotely issue has just. I mean, at the moment, it's just gone away. But there's a lot of surveys that show that both that both uh, men and women, parents of of young children, would really like much uh, more flexible work options. Uh, both in terms of hours, you know, I want to slip out for an hour to go to the I don't know the parent teacher school meeting, or you know, I want to be able to drop the kids off at school. 
you know, or whatever, whatever it happens to be. So it might be small things around time, but it's also around location. And obviously the work from home thing, you know, at the moment we've got rid of commutes for loads of people. It's saving hours and hours. But there may all be also be other benefits that, you know, if you look around your down your benefits and say, are these really disproportionately um, giving advantage to one group over the other? You know, as, I, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, Europe has much more... Um, support of um, parenting policies when you have a new child or or an early adopted baby which doesn't have to be baby or a newly adopted child um so in our in in the case of ireland we have 26 weeks paid leave and actually the us is the only country in the world the only developed country okay. that doesn't have this you know so crazy. i'm sure everybody knows but let's just it's say crazy it anyway. <laughs> right you know, it's yeah, but so at the moment, you know, in, in quite a lot of European countries, um, what's happening is is there the paternity leave, so the the that the dads get the paid leave that the dads get, you know, has gone from kind of two days to two weeks to whatever it is. So uh, I'm actually a proponent of not giving the women any more leave. And I, in fact, in some countries, you know, I would take some of that leave and give it to the dads. Um, because I think that changes the, the shape of the workplace. You know, imagine, you know, I'm the dad and you're and you're the mom or, you know, I'm parent one and you're parent two. Shouldn't be your parent. I'm parent one and you're parent A. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're, we're having a baby and you and I are looking for the same leaf. Like oh, the concern around, you know, the nonsense concern around hiring women or flexible work options. Like, how would that change the world if being, you know, a young male or female parent was 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 the same? That would be amazing, you know. Right. So I, mean, just I realize the, now I'm probably freaking some employers out, going, "Oh my god!" You know? Right. But the, the, the perspective of that, that it is a shared responsibility, right from the get up, is is so different, right? Um, and it's so important. And I, when one of the things I wonder about is with COVID and, and particularly in the U S with big, uh, employers and small, there's a big, you know, we're not going back, uh, in person in the same way we did, uh, which, which does a lot more remote takes away some of those geographic concerns, but I wonder how that will shape and shift the, the gender gap conversations, right? Yeah. Is it, is it, because for many women, this was a big part and now it's, it's just more standard. I, I don't, I don't have a great sense. I would love to get your thoughts on, on how do you think this is going to affect both the number of women in these professions and then the salaries of those women as well? Yeah. I mean, they, they, so there are women, there are more women in care work, as we know, we know that, you know, something like a million people in the U S I think it was in September last year, a million women lost their jobs. I mean, it was just a shocking number you know it's just a breath a breathtaking number. and the, um, but you think uh, of the people who are at the front line of health care also mostly women I mean somebody was at home looking after the kids the schools were closed and all this kind of thing so that meant it was the dads okay it could have also you know you know it could have also been the grandmothers and you know a few things like that but it's, it's got to have been to at least a significant percentage the dads so yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I, I would like to see um, paid parental leave balanced is because I think that gives the dads an opportunity to not only bond with the kids and, you know, you only have small children, you know, at one stage in your life, uh, generally speaking. Um, but it also gives them the experience of what it means to, you know, be the primary caregiver. So, you know, to your CEO, you know, if that was his situation, well, he knows what it's like when the child has a toothache and somebody has to pick them up from school or they break their arm in the yard or whatever, you know, whatever it happens to be. So as I think as the as the dads gain more care experience, um, you know, that will change the workplace for, for everybody, you know, but 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 a, but a sort of a, a slightly more scary version of that is as our populations age, you know, we don't all have children. But the vast majority of us have parents and, you know, the, the cost of elder care and everybody living longer, you know, lots of opportunities for product managers to make products for older people. <laughs> but um, I mean, that that one's coming down the line at us, I think. And, you know, that that's going to hit us at some point. And it has, you know, to an extent, it has hit with the boomers in the States. But I think not to the degree 
you know, that we can't kind of manage. We're still holding up the house of cards there, you know. So, and in terms of salary then, I mean, this one of the things I think is that above a certain threshold, other benefits of the job become more important, you know, like the flexible work. But also, I mean, the things that people say that they want from their career also relate to the people that they that they work with in the workplace and the int- interesting work opportunities, you know, progression and development. It's not just all about money and benefits. It's also about, you know, I like my team. We're doing good work. We're, we're making better products. You know, I'm my, my skills are growing. Um, and that can come back to the individual, the, the team manager and also the organization. You know, maybe we can't offer people more pay, but we can give them more something else that's meaningful, you know, within the context of the job. And I don't mean, you know, free pizza on a Friday or, you know. So I I think looking at that, you know, from an organizational perspective, looking at that list of benefits is not only about salary, it's also about all of the, all of the other stuff, you know. Yeah, no, that's great. All right. Whew. All right. We've talked about a lot of different things today, Jane. Uh, but if you were going to have, this is my favorite question to end on. Uh, if you were going to have people do two things differently tomorrow, based on what we talked about today, what would you want our listeners to do? Uh, I would want them to consider in advance what their choose to challenge phrase is. You know, a lot of the work that I do individually with people or in workshops and organizations is something happens and you go, ah, <laughs> brain freeze. Now, the way to avoid brain freeze is to have in advance figured out what your sentence is. Say, no, Rebecca, would you please let Mike finish there? You know, or whatever your sentence is, something that are words that you can feel safe saying. Um, and because you've said them in advance, you recognize the moment and say whatever. And that might, you know, that might be in 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 in, a, in an informal meeting. It might be a really bad situation, or it might just be a small thing. You know, that you're making sure that everybody's voice can be heard in that case. So that's one. Pick your choose to challenge phrase before you need to choose to challenge. And um, that would be one thing. And then the other thing would be ask your organization: Do we have a gender pay gap? That will be the two things because now you're working with data and, you know, people can see or at least the senior team can see or HR can see, you know, whoever it is can see that they're OK, we do. We've either promoted more men than women or we've hired in more senior men or we're paying our senior men more than we're paying our senior women or whatever it is. You know, but it gives you it gives you a number to work with like any good business challenge. Right. Yeah. yeah. If it matters, you measure it, you look at it, you decide, you can really see what's going on. So that makes a lot of sense. And I think the the choose the challenge, one of the things that's so powerful about that, knowing your phrase is, to your point, you practice it, you know it, you can give it and it, and it um, for me at least, I'm going to go super personal because I'm not speaking for anyone else. It helps it be less emotional, right? It helps it be... Yeah. Like, this is a response. This is a discussion. I was expecting this. This yeah. is how I'm going to help build it. And it keeps the frustration down. And some of the, I don't think, I think frustration is better than emotion because I'm not like emotional about it. It just makes me sad. Right. But yeah. when I get frustrated yeah. uh, on something, that's, that can be, that can be a difficult place for me. So I, I think being prepared on that just makes yeah. it seem like, yep. Just like you do when you're, when you're getting ready for a big presentation and you have people ask you questions that others might ask you, you're ready, you're prepared. It doesn't, throw you off and you can then feel like a strong part of the solution um, and and moving things forward in a place that you feel uh, more in control of than if it's, if it's less planned out. Yep. And anyone can do it. I mean, you know, any, anybody in the room can say, well, how did you feel about Joanna's idea over there? If you feel Joanna's idea hasn't been heard, you know, so, and there's, there's a good lot of, I, if for, for choose to challenge this year, I decided to, you know, make it about choosing to challenge within the context of a business conversation. So we put, you know, a load of suggested phrases on the website. Of course, we have we have what we have um, had one recently. You know, like I'm speaking, Mr. Vice President. I'm speaking, Mr. Vice President. You know, so that mightn't be everybody's ball of wax. That particular, <laughs> that particular one, but I can see it turning into a bit of a joke. You know, if right. if your organization is, you know. 
every organization has a different sense of humor as well, of course. So that might be the way to go either. But. One of my favorites, one of we were we were just talking the other day, he said that his son kind of called him out and said, I'm sorry if the end of my sentence keeps getting interrupted by the beginning of yours. <laughs> I was yeah. like, well, there what you a go. lovely phrase. <laughs> there you go, you see. And humor, you know, humor is right. nice. Humor, yes. you know, diffuses it, you know. Yeah. So pick yeah. your sentence in advance. Yep. Yeah. And look at your gender pay gap. That's excellent. Right All right. Jane, I really, really appreciate you coming on today. Thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And I think our listeners did too. Thanks for coming on. I hope it was useful. I hope it was useful. All right, that does it for today's episode. Thank you everyone for listening. And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career.